In the 1860s, an American paleontologist was studying specimens found near the town of Pavis in the Peruvian Amazon that were collected in a rich and unusual bed of mollusk fossils. The fossils didn't seem that odd, but they were pretty unlike the region's existing critters, and they seemed to even include some animals that usually preferred saltier water. That was strange, since Pavis was more than 2,000 kilometers up the Amazon River, far from the ocean. And scientists immediately questioned the discovery, trying to figure out how it was possible. What they didn't know was that just 13 million years ago, this area wasn't the upland jungle it is today. Instead, it was a massive series of lakes and wetlands, which we now call the Pavis system. Back then, the ancient sun beat down on brackish lakes and river channels that stretched on for hundreds of kilometers. And in the water were some of the most diverse and strange crocodilians ever seen on Earth, including possibly the closest a croc ever came to becoming a blue whale, at least in terms of feeding strategy. And this incredible wetland was fed by the Amazon River. Well, kind of. Because while there would one day be an Amazon, the waterway that fed the Pavis actually flowed in the opposite direction, westward, away from the Atlantic. So what did life look like when the Amazon watershed flowed backwards? How did its direction shape the evolution of life around it? And what force could possibly have been strong enough to upend one of the world's mightiest rivers between then and now? It turns out evolution can take some unique paths when a river gets pirated. It is truly an incredible thing just how big the Amazon River is. Its drainage basin covers nearly the entire width of the continent. So rain that falls in Peru, for example, only 160 kilometers from the Pacific, will instead flow over 4,000 kilometers to the Atlantic. But this wasn't always the case. When South America first started breaking away from Africa, the highlands under eastern Brazil were actually the uplands of the continent. This means that during the Eocene, roughly 55 to 34 million years ago when our story begins, the mighty rivers of South America ran westward, not eastward. Back then, those rivers probably drained somewhere near the Gulf of Guayaquil on the border of Peru and Ecuador. In fact, if you took a time machine to Peru during this period, it would look significantly different from the Amazon rainforest today. While part of the continent to the east was covered in rainforest, the western coast of South America probably wasn't dominated by a tropical jungle or sky-high peaks. Instead, it was more like a savanna, with forests growing up around rivers between scrubbier trees and open fields of grass. That's because by the end of the Eocene, the Earth is going through a bit of a cold, dry spell. The Atlantic Ocean, which loads up the westward winds with evaporated water, was much more narrow than it is today, because the rift between South America and Africa was still relatively new. That means there is less moisture blowing across South America. And without the modern Andes Mountains as a barrier, much of that moisture was just carried out over the Pacific Ocean, instead of being forced to fall on land. And yes, you heard me correctly, I said without the Andes, because although there were some mountains to be found along the western coast of South America, they weren't the giants that we see today. And the animals that inhabited this region were also not like what we see there today. The Cenozoic fossil record of the Amazon, all the way from 66 million years ago up until recently, is pretty poor, partly because it's really hard to look for fossils there. But we can still get some hints about what life was like at the time. Fossils unearthed along riverbeds near the town of Santa Rosa in east central Peru, for example, paint a picture of grasslands interspersed with rivers with trees growing along their banks. These were populated by small arboreal creatures like rodents, as well as the marsupials Wamardolops and the shrew possum Perulestes, who lived among the riverside trees above crocodilians lounging in the water. In the grasslands nearby grazed herbivorous, sheep-sized hoofed mammals called notoungulates. But things were changing. Ever since breaking away from Africa back in the Mesozoic, South America was steadily pushing westward. This was causing the continent to collide with the oceanic plates to its west. And slowly, bit by bit, the Andes were starting to form. It would take a long time for them to reach their present range in height. But by around 23 million years ago, the land in Peru and Colombia had risen enough to cause a problem. Rivers don't flow uphill. Plus, as the Andes grew, the increasing weight caused the planet's crust to flex down next to the mountains, creating a basin. Like if you place something heavy in the middle of a shelf, making it sag downwards. Suddenly, you had a continent's worth of water, now completely blocked by a nascent mountain range. And that changed everything. So what happens if you stop a continent's worth of water? Tucked up against the newly risen Andes, the water became trapped. Unable to cross the mountains, but also unable to drain eastward toward the Atlantic, the water pooled and pooled. Ultimately, it swamped the continent's interior and turned much of South America's heartland into an expansive mishmash of lakes and wetlands. This ecosystem would come to be known as the Pavis System, and it was gigantic. At its height, this ecosystem covered as much as a million square kilometers, an area the size of the modern country of Egypt. 
By this time, around 23 million years ago in the Miocene Epoch, the Earth had once again warmed from the chill of the previous epoch, and you would definitely have felt it there. It was hot and humid, a land of palm swamps with rainforests popping up on the drier bits of land. For many of the creatures of the savanna, this change would likely have been a disaster, dooming them to extinction. Even for those who didn't go extinct, the Pabus created a maze of barriers and connections. Land-based species may have struggled across the many big open bodies of water, isolating groups from palm trees to mammals. And aquatic organisms also struggled to adjust, like the ancestors of today's poison dart frogs, who had to deal with changing water conditions. But for life in the Pabus, change brought new opportunities, too. Like the sudden appearance of a land bridge across a swamp or a new waterway could have united long-separated populations or created shortcuts to new areas. And it turns out that this back-and-forth dance of isolation and connection promoted intense diversification in the species living there at the time. Using techniques like molecular phylogeny, which uses estimated rates of genetic change to figure out how recently two species diverge from each other, we can see radiations for all kinds of critters like reptiles, invertebrates, and especially fish. The species diversity of these groups abruptly increased as populations constantly found themselves in new environments, only to get trapped there, isolated, and forced to adapt. Indeed, by about 13 million years ago, we can see that the Pabus had become home to an incredibly diverse and abundant array of animals. Opossums and carnivorous marsupial relatives called sporacidonts moved along the ground while primates like capuchin monkeys and marmosets jumped around in the treetops. In the water, the bizarre rhino-like astrapotherium lazed around, half submerged in the water like a hippo. It also would have been joined by manatees and dolphins. But the most impressive thing was probably the crocodilians. A whopping seven different crocodilians all seemed to have been living here together at the same time. Some of them were even really big, like the gigantic Purusaurus. Adults of this species could reach 10 meters long, longer than saltwater crocodiles today, making them the largest continental predator of the Cenozoic. They may have had a bite stronger than any living animal, which they used to dine on some pretty large prey like meter-long turtles or ground sloths. Or take Morisuchus. With a wide, flat head, huge gullet, and tiny teeth, scientists are still debating how exactly this strange animal fed. Some have suggested that it gulped huge amounts of water into a throat pouch, then strained out small fish and arthropods to eat, kind of like a baleen whale. Meanwhile, other smaller mollusk-eating crocs were there, too, using crushing teeth to eat the clams and other invertebrates that thrived in the lake beds. These little guys, which include critters like Natasuchus, may have actually been the dominant crocs in some areas. And if you're wondering where all of Pabus' water did eventually go, it seems like it turned northward, draining toward the Caribbean instead. There even seem to have been episodes where the salty water from the Caribbean actually flowed back into the area, turning the Pabus system brackish explaining those salt-loving mollusks that early paleontologists found so fascinating. This connection is what brought coastal life like dolphins and manatees into the heart of the Amazon. Of course, today the Pabus is long gone, and the Amazon reigns. Which raises the question, what happened? What on earth could have flipped pretty much a whole continent's watershed? The answer is, once again, the Andes. While their uplift may have helped create the Pabus system in the first place by blocking the exit to the Pacific, their upward trajectory didn't stop there. As they kept rising, lifting the land higher, more and more sediment washed down from the upper reaches during rainstorms, blanketing the Pabus in silt and eventually filling it in. By about 10 and a half million years ago, the land had become so tilted that the waters that fed the Pabus began to run eastward toward the Atlantic. And around 500,000 years later, we start to see sediments from the Andes showing up at the mouth of the Amazon, a sign that by then, water was flowing all that way. This phenomenon, when rivers abruptly get rerouted, is known as river capture or, wait for it, river piracy. Over time, more and more water that had once flowed toward the Pabus reversed course and started running down toward the Atlantic. This may represent the largest series of river piracy events in Earth's history, and continued for a long time, even up to the present. Today, parts of the Rio Orinoco are in the process of being pirated away by the Rio Negro. And this was, well, not great news for some of the organisms that have been living in the Pabus, like many of the crocs. The big crocs disappeared completely, and like, thank goodness for that. And while those little clam-eating crocs stuck around for a little while longer, even they eventually disappeared, along with their prey. And the new drainage, along with other factors like climate change drying things out, may have contributed to the extinction of other critters, like those carnivorous prasodonts, who probably struggled once the thick rainforest turned back into an open canopy, and they left no modern descendants. So this might seem bleak, but actually, alongside these extinctions, was a new flourishing of speciation and diversification. Because while many once separate watersheds became combined into one continuous corridor, there were also new cycles of opening and closing waterways, similar to what happened during the Pabus system's time. Today, the area that had once been the Pabus is divided into the modern Magdalena, Orinoco, and Amazon river systems. This spawned yet more diversification, 
especially among the fish that swam in the rivers and among the monkeys. Capuchin monkeys, for instance, may have taken advantage of the new Riverside Highway to spread from the Atlantic-facing forest westward. And a 2021 analysis of the ranges of modern animals found evidence of this intracontinental interchange in the current distribution of stingrays, electric fishes, birds, and mammals, for example. Over time, things would settle down into the flow that we're more familiar with. But we could still see the effects of the Pabus and those river captures in what lives there today. The connection to the Caribbean that brought critters like dolphins and manatees mean they still patrol the rivers. The patches of specially enriched soil throughout the region that help support high plant diversity may be the remnants of marine nutrients that washed in during the Pabus. Overall, the flip-flopping of South America was a dramatic tectonic and evolutionary story, one that set up the continent for the rich species diversity that we see today. The constant closing and opening of pathways repeatedly isolated and reunited species, driving them to evolve in spectacular ways. And towering above it all are the Andes, the longest continental mountain chain in the world, and the force that flipped a continent around and forever shook up life in the process. In 1977, a Chilean farmer was plowing his field on a plateau high in the Andes when he stumbled upon a giant fossilized skeleton. How did this marine reptile end up on the side of a mountain? Find out in our episode, The Sea Monster from the Andes. Thanks to this month's eontologists for going with the flow. <laughs> if there's a bad hydrology joke, I have not heard it. Addie, Annie and Eric Higgins, Carl Wolfel, Juan M., Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Nico Robin, and Rafael Hassa. Become an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons and you can get fun perks like getting access to a monthly short video from a member of the Eons team. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Ken Barnes studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more ancient adventures. I was just thinking this story has everything, you know? It has giant crocodiles, electric fishes, um, hydrology, what's not to love? Pirates. Yeah, river pirates. Piracy. Yep. It writes itself. <laughs>